Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. Okay, it's 11 o'clock. We're going to get going. Um, hopefully people will start to funnel in. Um, good morning. My name is Thomas Bowles. I'm the Extension Agent here in Prince William County. Um, today's class is on scouting for insects. So just a little bit about Virginia Cooperative Extension. We're a partnership between the county and the two land-grant universities, Virginia Tech and Virginia State. And our mission is to bring research-based information out to the public. And we are in Prince William County, but we have extension offices throughout the state. And if you're in a different state, then we have, uh, or your state has extension offices uh, in most counties as well. So our path today is we're going to look at IPM or integrated pest management, talk about knowing your enemy, managing insect pests, and then we'll take questions. So first of all, what is IPM? And as I said, it's integrated pest management. And so it's a systematic approach on dealing with pests. It's a process rather than uh, a silver bullet solution. And it balances long-term pest control with minimizing potential harm. And it's a pyramid. And as you go up the pyramid, you increase the amount of toxicity and intervention you're doing. Um, and so we want to stay in this green part, this lower part with cultural practices, physical mechanical practices um, before we get into chemicals. Chemicals are our last resort. So the process is, first of all, you want to know your plant. Know what it needs, know what its usual problems are, um, and have an idea of when those problems usually show up. If you know the typical insects, for example, that attack your plants, then you can be on the lookout for them, and it's much easier to spot them if you know what you're looking for. And so we want to scout regularly which means we want to go out and we want to look for those problems and we want to do it in a targeted way. If we know, for example, that we get squash bugs after the squash have started to flower, then we're going to target the squash bugs. Once we start seeing flowers, we're going to look for squash bugs. We're going to look for them in the parts of the plant where we expect to find them. And it's part of knowing your enemy. So then what we want to do is identify what the pest or pests is are. Um, different pests can have similar signs and symptoms. Uh, sometimes it's an insect problem. Sometimes it's a disease problem. Sometimes it's both. Sometimes one is the cause of the other. And so you want to look at the whatever that primary or root cause is. Um, and then determine if control is really necessary. And so the picture here we have on the right, we have a tomato hornworm that has all these little white things coming out. Those little white things are cocoons. And what has happened is a bracted wasp has laid its eggs inside this particular caterpillar. And they are in the process, the larvae are in the process of eating away on the inside. Uh, once they come out of the pupa, um, they'll turn into new bracket wasps. Uh, but in the meantime, this caterpillar is pretty much dead. It's still living, but for all intents and purposes, it's not feeding, it's not causing problem. So we wouldn't want to control this particular caterpillar. We have a bunch of caterpillars like this, not a problem, because nature's taking care of it for us. So once we determine, yeah, we really need to do something, we need to look at, well, what are our options? And we need to make sure that our control option matches our pests. So for example, I can remember being in Afghanistan and there being an insect problem on these fruit trees. And this farmer was convinced that he was going to apply sulfur. Well, sulfur is a great fungicide, but it doesn't really do anything against insects. And so we had to educate him uh, so that his control would mask the pest, and so it would be effective, and so he would 
not have the problem uh, because if he had just applied sulfur, it wouldn't have done anything. And it's important to understand the pros and cons of each control method that you're using. Um, so you know what you're getting into and make an informed decision. Where can you get help? Um, our Prince William Horticulture Help Desk, which is mastergardener at pwcva.gov is one place you can get help with identifying pests and getting information on controls. Um, you can also do Google searches um, where you're looking for .eud or .gov websites. These are university and government websites. And so they will be giving you um, research valid information. One thing to keep in mind that if you get information from out of state, the pesticide recommendations shouldn't be followed. You need to follow Virginia's pesticide recommendations. Sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're not. Um, but pesticide laws vary from state to state. So you want to make sure you're using a product that's been approved for use in Virginia. Once you ID the pest and potential controls, then you want to decide on a strategy. And again, you want to do the least harm to humans, non-target species, and the environment. You can always escalate later, but you want to start with the least toxic um, option. And again, you're evaluating the benefits and risks of each tactic. Um, you're choosing what's most effective. And uh, one thing that you can do is we have a YouTube video on becoming a garden detective, which was done by Master Gardener Amy Fulsh, which is an excellent, um, it's vegetable focused, but it's an excellent video on looking at what pests is there, what the problem is, and how to research uh, what possible solutions are. So when we look at our pest control options, we've got a fairly big toolbox. Um, there are natural controls, and these are things that nature does. And for the most part, we don't, well, we do have some control over natural controls. The natural controls are things like um, the climate, which we don't have control over really. Um, but parasites, parasitoids, predators, which we do have a little bit of control over. If we build the right environment for good bugs that are predators of bad bugs, then they will come. So we do have a little bit of control over uh, some of our natural controls. But the applied controls are the things that we typically have the most control over. And the two that we want to focus on to begin with our host resistance and cultural controls. And so host resistance is, if you've ever bought tomatoes and you've seen the, the letters after them like VHF, um, those are tomato varieties that are resistant to different um, diseases. And so if you buy plants that are resistant to the usual diseases, then you're less likely to have a problem. Cultural controls are things like making sure that you're growing the plant in the environment that the plant will thrive in. So for example, you don't want to grow lavender in wet soils because lavender hates wet soils. It needs well-drained soils. Lavender's never going to do good in wet soils. Um, and so culturally, if we want to improve the health of our lavender, we're putting it in a well-drained soil. Biological controls are, um, basically taking the natural enemies of our bad bugs and releasing them. That's a little bit tricky to do. Um, you, have to, you have to make sure that you've got viable um, sources. You have to make sure that you apply them at the right time. And you also have to understand that biological control is not instant control. So if you have a massive pest problem and you release biological control, it's going to take some time before that pest problem gets under control. Mechanical um, control options are things like pulling weeds, um, picking off bugs, those sorts of things. Sanitation is important. Uh, a lot of our disease problems um, will get disease material, will fall to the ground, and we'll leave it there. And if we leave it there, then we're providing 
you know, refuge for that disease. If we clean that up, then we're getting that out of the environment and we're reducing um, our possible pest issue. And then lastly, we have um, organic and synthetic chemical options. So we have a, a teaching garden out in Bristow and we don't use insecticides. And the reason we don't use insecticides is we like natural controls. And here's some examples of some natural controls. Tiffia wasps, um, it's a lovely little wasp that will uh, dig a little hole and it will lay its eggs on white grubs and those grubs will hatch into larvae and they'll start feeding on those grubs and kill those grubs for us. Um, I'm not sure how this is pronounced, but I'm going to, going to give it a shot. I think it's phoretic mites. Um, these are infesting a June beetle. There's a tachnic fly up here in the upper right, and the tachnic fly can lay eggs on Japanese beetles, and those Japanese beetles will be infected by the larva, and the larva will kill the adults, and so you don't end up with white grubs. So if we build the right environment, nature will take care of a lot of our problems for us. It's really important that you know your enemy. The more you know about your plants and their pests, the better you can manage them. Um, and so it does take a lot of research. And even if you've grown something for years and years, it's important that you understand the problems that can happen. Who are the usual suspects and be on the lookout for them. So what should you know? Well, we're talking about insects. What does the bug look like? When does it usually show up? Where on the plant does it hang out? How much damage is this bug actually going to do? And does this damage, or what does this damage look like? Okay, so we want to think about those sorts of things. And the same thing with, with diseases. What does this disease look like? When do we usually have it? Um, what parts of the plant does it affect? What kind of damage does it do? Um, those sorts of things. So let's take a look at these two pictures. <coughs> Excuse me. So which of these is brown patch and which of these is grub damage? Or are they both the same? You look at them. These are two different lawns, and so they're taken from two different perspectives. But you see, you know, there's a lot of dead grass and there's a lot of open space, uh, uh, bare soil. Could be brown patch, could be grub damage. So one on the left is actually brown patch, which is a fungal issue. And the one on the right is grub damage, which is an insect issue. And again, it goes to, you know, sometimes you have similar symptoms, but different pests. And it's important to know which pest is which. And one way you can tell with grubs is you can dig under the soil, pull back the grass, and look and see if you actually do have grubs. Know your plan. Like I said, what are the conditions they need to thrive? What are the things that stress them? If we're pushing performance at the wrong time of the year, or if we're pushing them to maximize their yields, um, then we're stressing them. If we give them too much fertilizer, too little fertilizer, it stresses them. If we give them fertilizer at the wrong time, if we give them too much, too little water or light, or if we prune them too much, we don't prune them enough. All these things can affect how stressed your plant is. And the more stressed your plant is, the more open it is to disease and insect problems. And so, for example, with turf, we have these two pictures of grasses. Um, if you are pruning, or what we call uh, pruning in turf is mowing, if you're mowing at the right height, say four inches with cool season grasses, then you're shading out potential weeds, but if you start cutting it too low, you let sunlight in and you start having weed problems. And so a lot of people are pushing for a nice short carpet of grass and they're not letting the plants live the life that they're supposed to live. And so they're opening up the canopy and they're opening the turf up to weeds. It's also important to know the pest life cycles, know what the predators are, 
know what insects look like in pests, and again, seek information from reliable sources like the Extension Service. So if we look at these, those are nasty looking things, aren't they? Are they good bugs? Are they bad bugs? Well, if you don't know, you might be tempted to squash them just indiscriminately. But they're actually the larval stage of lady beetles. And they're actually the most voracious stage of the lady beetle. These guys in the larval stage will yield far more aphids than they will as adults. And so if we were to randomly think, oh, that's a scary looking bug, let's kill it, we would actually be affecting the predators that are going after our bad bugs. So again, knowing life cycle, here's another example of this is a pest, this is an invasive pest. Um, we want to know when we should be on the lookout for it. So, for example, in this year, because of the weather, the very end of April, we started to see these young black and white nymphs. We'll have those into late June, early July, uh, and then we'll start seeing the red nymphs, which is the last nymphal stage, and then mid to late July, we'll start seeing adults. And so knowing this past and knowing this life cycle, we know what to look for when. Another common pest, Japanese beetles. So Japanese beetles, we look at the life cycle over the course of the year. We know that we don't want to treat for white grubs during June and July because that's when they're up and out. Um, we want to treat them in August because that's when they're in the larval stage or the grub stage, and they are the most vulnerable to pesticides, assuming that we decide that we want to use pesticides to treat them. But for example, October, November, January, February, they're too deep in the soil for those type of controls to actually reach the grub. Um, as you get into March and April, the grubs are up higher but the grubs are much more resistant to insecticides. So again, it's knowing by enemy. So here's a, another uh, example of a bad bug. This is the asparagus beetle, and there are two types. You look on the right, um, there's the spotted and the common. Um, their larvae kind of look like, I don't even know how to describe it. They, they kind of look like little slugs, but um, they're just little fat things that are just squishy. Um, they're easy to squish at that stage, by the way. The eggs look like little pegs coming out of the asparagus. And this is probably the easiest stage to kill them because they're not moving around. And basically, you just scrape the eggs off and crush them. Um, we know we've got adults when we start seeing damage like this on the left. Little holes cut out on our asparagus. Um, and so sometimes we'll only see the damage because the, bit, the bugs aren't feeding when we're there. And so it's important to be able to see the damage side, potential eggs, the different life cycle, um, so that we can identify and know what's going on. And if we get them at the egg or the larval stage, then we will prevent some of the damage that we get on the part of the plant that we want to harvest. The harlequin bug, harlequin bugs, they're actually neat looking bugs, but they do a lot of damage, particularly to leafy vegetables. Um, their eggs are really cool. They're these psychedelic um, black and white eggs. They're, they're really tiny, um, but they're laid in rows and they're typically on the underside of the leaves. And typically that's where we find the eggs and the young nymphs, but as they get older, they're gonna be on the top of the leaf and so again, it's a matter of where do I start looking for this? Where am I going to find it? Squash bugs, bane of my existence. Um, squash bugs will infect a variety of things in the cucurbit family. Um, they lay their eggs on the underside of leaves in the crotch of the veins. Um, these little, they're really hard to get off the leaf. Um, they're hard to crush with your fingers. Generally speaking, um, I carry a little snip scissors, cut those out, drop those into uh, a jar with water and um, 
a little dish soap and drown them all out. That's a good way to deal with them. Once they get to the nymph, nymph stage, they are numerous and they are hard to get all of them, um, but they are squishable. And as we see in the lower left, this is kind of damage that they'll do to leaves. They are vectors for disease. And so while the squash bug itself will do damage, it's not fatal, but if they happen to be a carrier of one of the diseases that affects uh, squashes and pumpkins, they're going to end up spreading that disease and that's what's going to kill your pumpkin. So you want to get rid of the squash bugs before they become a problem. Cabbage worm is another one we see quite a bit in the garden. Um, it's a moth that has spots on its wings. Um, the eggs in the upper right, you really need a hand lens to see. I have uh, going down in the lower right, that's the pupa stage. I've never seen pupa stage in the wild. Um, what we see most often on our brassicas in particular are the worms, and the worms are about an inch, two inches long, and they hide out on the mid vein of the leaves and they blend in really well. And so it's really hard sometimes to see them. And so you've got to be careful about scouting them. Um, and you have to look under every leaf to find them. The best way to deal with them is to not let the moth lay eggs on the brassicas. And we can do that with exclusion. That's one of the controls that we can use that doesn't involve pesticides. So again, it's important to know good bug versus bad bug. Green lace wings, these are good bugs. Um, if you see little threads, these little egg sacs, those are lace wing eggs. And the reason why they're individually on each little thread is because if they were laid together, they would eat each other up. These are voracious insects that are great predators that we want to see. And this particular uh, set of lacewing eggs is on a garlic plant. This is the larval stage. The larval stage, like I said, is very voracious eater. This is a good bug. Even though it looks ugly and scary, we don't want to kill it. We want to encourage it. So again, with managing pests, we want to know what damage the pest does and know what else causes similar damage. And we want to know what the early, mid, and late damage looks like. And we want to know if that damage invites other issues. And so the two pictures we have on the right are two things that can happen if you let spotted lanternflies get out of hand. Now, a spotted lanternfly is this moth-shaped um, creature that's over here on the upper left one. Um, you can see there is a wasp underneath it, and that's because the spotted lanternfly's poop is a very sweet, sticky substance. And so because it's sweet and sticky, uh, well, because it's sweet, it attracts wasps. And so if you've got a lot of wasps buzzing around, it could be you've got spotted lanternflies that are causing it. The other thing that really likes that sticky, sweet excrement from the spotted lanternfly, if we look at the lower picture, um, spotted lanternfly, when you see that little strip of red, that's what spotted lanternfly is. But you see all of this dark stuff over all these leaves. Well, that's sooty mold. Sooty mold really likes the excrement that comes out of spotted lanternfly. And so that's a secondary indicator that you've got spotted lanternfly as an issue. So it's important to know not only what damage it does, but what secondary effects could happen. And there are several things actually that cause sooty mold, but spider lanternfly is one of them. Again, we want to know if it's worth controlling. How bad is the damage? Is it really something we need to worry about? Uh, we showed you that have in the upper right, we showed you the hornworm that is having a bad day because it's got technifly um, larva in him, and he's basically a zombie that's going to die. Um, we don't want to control that. White grubs, big problem in lawns. How do we know if the damage is bad enough? Well, a lot of insects that we have what's referred to as a threshold number. 
And that's the number of pests that it's usually economically advantageous to treat for. So with white grubs, it's 10 per square feet. And so if we peel back square foot randomly throughout the yard, um, and we actually look and count, we see in this lower picture, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. In this particular case, we've got 11 within a square foot. We're averaging over or 10 or more. That's when we want to apply a product like GrubX, which is a grubicide, to take care of the problem. If we have less than 10, then they're not really doing that much damage. And you probably don't want to treat. Also, when you pull the, the turf back, you can actually pick these up and you can put them on a plate and the birds will love you because birds love eating white grubs. Um, or you can put them in a jar with soapy water and you drown them. So, excuse me, brachnid wasp is what attacks the hornworm. Um, sign for the hornworm are these grenade looking crass or poops. Um, here's a healthy hornworm. These are infected hornworms down at the bottom. And then when the hornworm finally dies, it turns this black, ugly color. Um, and you can see in the picture next to it, if you can see my cursor, um, that's where fly uh, is, or excuse me, a wasp is emerging. Um, so again, knowing do we want to treat this or do we want to encourage nature to take its course? Sometimes we can't let nature take its course. Sometimes we have to intervene. Um, again, chemical controls are our option of last resort. Um, we want the, to grow the plants to be as healthy as they can, but sometimes we need to use mechanical controls. Um, in this particular case, in this picture, we have two controls that we're using. One is a row cover, and so we're trying to prevent harlequin beetles from uh, getting to our brassicas. We're trying to prevent cabbage moss from getting to our uh, brassicas. And so we put this row cover over top of them to exclude them. The other thing we've done, and it's hard to see, um, you can see the arrow where it says trap crop. What a trap crop is, is it's a plant that our pest finds more palatable than the crop that we're growing to eat. And so, for example, if you think about squashes, um, Squash and pumpkin are more palatable to squash bugs than cucumbers, even though they're in the same family. And Hubbard squash is the most palatable to squash bugs. And so sometimes we'll grow Hubbard squash with the idea that most of our pests are going to go to that Hubbard squash plant, and there we can control them on that trap crop much easier than having to pick through all of the other squashes we're growing. Um, and most of the damage is going to be in the trap crop. And again, seek advice from reliable in-state sources on how to manage the pests that you have. Again, we want to choose the least toxic option. We want to be down here in the lower part of the pyramid, the base of the pyramid, where we're preventing issues rather than reacting. Consider if the control will solve the problem. A classic example of this is disease on turf. Most of the turf di diseases that we get in Northern Virginia are cosmetic. And so they're not threatening the life of the plant, even though the plant looks awful when it gets the disease. And when you apply a fungicide on a turf that has disease, it's not going to fix the turf. The turf is still going to look awful. It's just going to kill the fungus. And if you can wait for the weather to change, the same thing's going to happen. So do you, is this control really going to affect anything? Um, the other thing is, will this control harm things that I don't want to be harmed? One of the things that we have to consider when we, I'll go back here, when we're back dealing with our friend, the white grub, 
if we, if we end up having enough grubs where we decide that we want to treat them, we also have to understand that there are good grubs in the soil that we're pretend, we are potentially killing as well. And so we have to weigh that factor when we decide, okay, I'm going to use chemicals. So that's important to know as well. Um, and then if we do decide that we're going to use a pesticide, and when I'm talking pesticides, I mean insecticides, grubicides, herbicides, all of them. Always read and follow the label instructions. It's very important that you do that, not only to protect the environment, but to protect yourself as well. Um, and to protect your plants, because a lot of pesticides, if you use them incorrectly, will actually harm the plant. Um, also understand that an organic Pesticide does not mean it's safe. Just because it's organic doesn't mean it's any less of a poison than a synthetic pesticide. And so you still have to read the label, you still have to be careful and follow the instructions. I want you to use pesticide safely. It's really important that you use pesticide safely. Um, it's really easy to inadvertently hurt yourself with pesticides and sometimes it's not going to show up as an acute problem but if you're using pesticides a lot and you're not using them properly you know the chronic um, toxicity is going to catch up with you and so you really want to use your pesticides carefully read and follow all label instructions and understand that labels change so it's important that just because you've used weed be gone for example um, for years doesn't mean that you don't need to flip through and make sure there aren't any changes in your name. So some resources for you that can help. Um, the one on the left here is Meet the Beneficials. These are natural enemies of garden pests. This is a, actually a poster that you can get from UC Davis, um, but you can also download the PDF. We also have um, some commonly found vegetables in Virginia that was compiled by um, one of our specialists at the Eastern Shore uh, Agricultural Resources and Education Center um, that gives you, you know, look, some of the common culprits that you're going to find on vegetables so you can be on the lookout for them. And they're listed here. There's also, uh, we have a video on pesticide safety for the home gardener. Um, and again, the Becoming a Garden Detective video that I mentioned earlier is another good resource. With that, I will take questions. I don't see too many. Anybody have any questions for Thomas today? <clears throat> I don't. Are they, uh, I have one, Thomas. The grub, uh, mostly um, uh, Japanese beetle larvae? Most of the grubs that we find in lawns in Virginia are actually mass chafer beetles, which are um, like Japanese beetles, the grubs do significant turf damage. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the one of the natural controls of Japanese beetles are milky spore, and there is a cousin of milky spore that works on mass chafer beetles. But if we're using fungicides in, on our turf, we're also, also killing fungicides in the top layer of the soil. And so that uh, disease that will affect those grubs will get killed by the fungicide. So that's another sort of, am I going to do more harm than good by using this particular control decision that we need to make? And the lawn services really kind of push fungicide starting about right now because of uh, brown patch and sometimes it's pretty costly. Yeah, the, you can use, so if you use a fungicide, once you have a problem, it's gonna kill the problem. And again, the damage is already done and you, know, you just have to wait for the plant to grow out of it. But you can also use it as a preventative. And the problem with using it as a preventative is A, you gotta know when to start and B, you got to keep reapplying it. And so as you keep reapplying it, you're killing more and more of the good fungus in the soil. Um, and whether that fungus is 
you know, something that's going to attack bad bugs in the soil, or if it's a fungus that actually is working with your grass in a symbiotic relationship, you're going to kill all that using a lot of fungicide. And so a lot of times you're better off not using fungicide. There's one disease that rarely happens in Prince William and Northern Virginia in general called Pythium blight. And Pythium blight will kill grass, but it's usually something that happens really quick. And it's really obvious, Pythium blight is really obvious versus uh, some of the other diseases that we get. And so that's one thing that, um, that you definitely want to treat for. But generally speaking, with most of our, our turf diseases, we're doing more harm than good by treating them. Are you expecting some of these fungus dis more uh, fungus fungal diseases because of our weather that we've been having? Um, so there are fungal diseases that like um, cool and wet, and there are fungal diseases that like warm and wet. And it really depends on how much moisture we get as to what kind of um, fungal pressure we're going to have. Um, brown patch is one of those that likes heat and humidity. Um, and so, you know, the more humid of a summer that we have, the more likely we're going to have brown patch issues, especially since tall fescue, which makes up most of our lawns, um, really is susceptible to brown patch. I have a question. How do you recommend uh, dealing with woolly hackberry aphids? Depends on how big the plant is, but if it's small enough, I would get a hose and put it on jet and just blow them off. Um, that's one way of dealing with them. Um, you know, if you have a lot of plants that are susceptible to that, you might think about um, getting some lady beetles. The important thing with lady beetles is don't release them in the afternoon because then they'll fly off. Release them in the morning. Um, if it's really bad and it's all over the plant and it's causing uh, a lot of damage, you might consider an insecticide. I would have to look up what the appropriate insecticide is to deal with aphids, um, but that's another option. She can contact the horticultural help desk for that recommendation if you'd like. Yes. <clears throat> But a lot, but I was just going to say, a lot of times you can just blast them off with a hose and aphids have such little legs, it takes forever for them to get back up on the plant. Um, I have a personal question. The ants are coming in the house, house this year, and at this time of year, the black ants. Any recommendations? I mean, besides trying to find holes, of which there are many. So a lot of times when we have a lot of excess moisture, um, ants are going to decide that they need a drier place to live, and so they come inside. And ideally, you can seal the house to prevent them from coming in. But as we all know, it, ants will find a way because they can get into the tiniest cracks that we can't see. Um, I recommend using uh, the baits that are the ant baits that are out there. And the ant baits are boric acid based in most cases. And what happens is the ants will eat that base and it will kill them. But they'll also take some of that bait because that bait's kind of sweet. They'll take that bait and they'll take it back to um, the anthill and other ants will eat it and it will kill those ants as well. So the baits are very effective and they don't have a lot of, you don't run into a lot of problems with um, killing um, non-target species. Great. I'll try that. The other thing, if you know that they're coming in from a particular area, you can lay boric acid over that path um, and they tend not to cross boric acid because mm. again, it's toxic to them. I'd forgotten about that. Boric acid is a little hard to find anymore. Um, a lot of times you've got to get it at a drugstore. Um, for some reason, boric acid, I mean, boric acid has a number of uses, and, and um, I can't think of it well. 
in a high enough doses, boric acid is a poison to humans. So I can see why that might be a little bit, you know, something that you want to control. But I don't understand why it's so difficult to get boric acid when it's so useful. And Linda, you're right. Most pharmacies will carry boric acid, but you got to a lot of times you have to go and ask for it. I don't see any more questions. Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, our next class is June 25th, um, where I believe we're talking about flowering shrubs. And we look forward to seeing you at that class. And I hope you all have a good rest of your day. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Thomas. That was great. If you enjoyed this video, please let us know with your questions, comments, and suggestions for other classes. For more information on lawns and gardens, contact the Extension Horticulture Help Desk at um, mastergardener at pwcgov.org. Thank you, and we hope to see you next time.